Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Webinar Express. Use Google Analytics to make better marketing decisions, organized by CIM Southeast. If you are a university student attending today's webinar, you may want to sign up for the CIM Marketing Club newsletter. It will keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is take a photograph of the QR code you can see on the screen at the moment, and it will take you straight to the sign up page on the CIM website. So I'd now like to hand you over to Jeff Roy, Director of LeapFrog Internet Marketing, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Jeff. Great. Thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, I'm going to use Google Analytics to make better marketing decisions. So Google Analytics is, is, is a sea of data. Uh, and I think when you first log into it, you think this is all really useful data. But what does it mean? And, and, and more importantly, how can I use it to make to make better decisions about how you drive your marketing forward? Um, so I'm hopefully I'm going to go through six points um, that hopefully will give you. I'm not going to comprehensively um, go through how to use Google Analytics, but I've I've personally been using these six points for quite a while to um, to ultimately get better outcomes on a website. And that could be either driving more sales or, or generating more leads from my website. Um, so we're going to look at number one. First of all, we're going to look at marketing channels, uh, which are the stickiest. Uh, where do people come from? Um, we're going to look at uh, leaks. You know, and, and and how does your website? Where does your website lose visitors? And, and what you may want to do about that? I want to talk a lot about bounce rate. I think. Is bounce always bad? And I and I don't think so. I think sometimes marketers can get hung up too much on bounce rate. Um, I want to talk about search keywords, the keywords that put, people put into Google before they come to your website. Those have technically left Google Analytics. They left a while back and, and how you can get those back. And then I want to talk about content and, and maybe inspiring you to write fresh content based on, on data that is readily available for you. And then finally, just want to talk about the future and a thing called GA4 that you may or may not have heard of. So let's dig in. Let's get straight into marketing channels. We can get people coming to our website from a number of ways. It could be social media. It could be organic from Google. It could be from an email newsletter. You know, it would be good to understand which, which of those is, is actually the most successful or the stickiest. OK, so I'm going to switch and, and, and a lot of this presentation. I'm going to actually use uh, Google Analytics live. So do forgive me if the screen isn't uh, it freezes or we have Internet problems. So to have a look at your channels coming into your website. So I'm in Google Analytics now for my own website. On the left hand side, you've got the menu system. Um, go into acquisition and then open up all traffic and then go into channels. Uh, and then you can then see the traffic that is driving the most user visits. So I think I'm set up for uh, last last 30 days of data. Okay, so we've got roughly a month's worth of data. What was happening? Where are people coming from? So you can see on the face of it, for example, organic. So people that come in from a search on Google is actually driving the most people into uh, into my particular web into my website. And that's that's great. OK, that feels very successful. Um, but it's not just a quantity game. It's it's a quality. And what's what I love to see here is actually social. If you look at the organic, people are spending roughly two minutes uh, each session. But actually social, when people come in off social, they're spending nearly three minutes um, now. That could be that we're driving, we're probably sharing more of our kind of blog content on social. And a lot of our blog content is maybe 600 words to 1,000 words. So they're spending longer, um, you know, digesting that content. So that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, you, you can then see, you can see some other things going on there. For example, that social is great but they're not actually then converting so a conversion for for our for our website is is somebody really asking for an seo audit um, and every conversion is different depending on the website but you can see from this data that people coming from social 
aren't, whereas you can see organic and direct aren't. So it's it's horses for courses. They're certainly stickier in social, but then they're not taking an action. So I think there's definitely insights to be had from this particular this particular page. Okay, so that's that's all about where people come from when they arrive on your website. And then clearly we can then try and understand. We would love it, wouldn't we, if people arrived on our website and never left. But clearly they are going to leave. But if we could minimise that, uh, hopefully that increases them the chance of them taking an action that you wish on the website. That could be a sale or, or generating a lead. So there's a book that I read recently, Bryony Thomas, Watertight Marketing, and she talks about her, her marketing funnel where potential customers drop in at the top and then you try and take them through these, these stages of awareness, interest, evaluation, trial, and hopefully you get a you get a, a customer dropping out the bottom end. But on the way, you can certainly leak uh, leak customers. And I, and I really like this in terms of there was a lot of analogies to to your website in terms of you get someone dropping in the top, they arrive, and then how can you influence them on your website to then take an action that that, that you want? Okay. So again, if we go back into Google Analytics. You can see uh, there's a section here in behavior uh, and then site content and then exit pages. So ultimately, where do people leave on your website? Which page? So you can see, for example, we had 73 people leave from the home page. OK, uh, and you can see some of the exit rates here. So one um, I'm not so concerned about is people that arrive at our contact page often then leave. But to me, a contact page would be a natural end to their journey anyway. If they get to our contact page and then fill in our, our contact form, I'm really happy with that because that's that's a potential lead for us. That's, that's somebody who wants to talk to us uh, in, in our case about SEO. So I'm okay with that. I can deal with that. They have got to leave at some point. Um, where I'm not maybe uh, so happy with is I've got a landing page uh, here. So our strategy is we optimize for our key term, which is SEO Agency Hampshire. Uh, and if you look at uh, if you look at that search there, um, you can see we're listed here. So when someone clicks through to there, they land on this landing page. Uh, and you can see that I'm getting a lot of people landing on the page and then they're just leaving. Uh, so that makes me think as a marketer, well, what do I need to change? Uh, and I'm wondering at the moment, um, they've only just landed on my website and I'm almost proposing to them straight away. Maybe maybe my call to action of getting a free SEO audit isn't where they are at that particular time. Uh, so maybe I need to put softer calls to action in. Maybe I maybe offer them a free a free download on SEO tips or something gentler maybe than than just get in touch with us if you see what I mean. So um, that would be that one. If we go back to the data again, we can see that there's quite a lot of exit happening on, on a particular blog com piece of blog content. Now, someone coming in to read about top influencers in Guildford, Surrey, I think they're a long, long way away from being a, one of our potential customers. So maybe if I just, if I wanted them to stick around a bit longer, maybe offer them I know more content uh, to click on, maybe related posts, say, down at the bottom here. Those sort of decisions going around your head as a marketer in terms of how how you could try and get people to stay on your website longer or, or take a lesser action, basically. OK, so bounce rate. Bouncing could be natural, right? You know, it's the, ten, the, the technical definition of a bounce rate on your website is, is an effect where someone lands on one uh, web page and then, it, then they leave. So a session begins and ends on the same page. And it, this is one of the questions I get a lot where people say, well, I've got a high bounce rate on this page. And that's a real problem. What should we do about it? Um, so if, we'd go, um, if we go back into Google Analytics, I'm going to now go into behavior, site content, and then all pages. And we start to then get a list of our pages. And you can see their, their, their bounce rate here. So how many just arrive on these, and then they leave. OK? So you again, we go back to that contact page, and then, and then they leave. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? They, they land on the contact page, hopefully make an inquiry, and then go, great, I'll leave this website now, because they're going to get in touch with us. 
I've got another example of this where bounce isn't necessarily a problem. So we have a, a, a client called a, den, uh, it's a dentist. So we search for a dentist near me. You find the dentist. You can imagine that person maybe has toothache, is in pain, they're in a hurry. They would land on our client's website uh, and eight times out of 10, they're actually on their iPhone. Uh, so it would look like this to them. And they literally are not missing about, they would literally uh, go to one page of the website and click call us. And that would technically be a bounce. So we, what we find with our dentist client is the bounce rate is, is very, very high, but that's, that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing if they've actually then called us. So I think really all I wanted to say was that, you know, bounce, uh, bounce isn't necessarily a bad thing. We've got another thing going on with an e-commerce website that we manage. So if we look at the page that we, it's a bra size guide basically, okay, for a particular brand. Uh, and we get a, we get very much kind of a high exit rate, people leaving the site. The reason it gets so many people come to the website is it's found for basically looking for a bra size in centimeters. Okay, so when you look at that in here, we this, this, this brand shows up, you click through, uh, and then you find this bra size guide. And of course, once someone's found out what that conversion is in centimeters, they've found their information, they're gonna leave. So that will be a, a very high bounce rate. That then has got us thinking about how can we possibly get people to stick on this website? Could we, if they clicked on their particular bra size, serve them up bras in that size or show them more content? It is quite a basic page at the moment with nothing else on it. So that's given us food for thought in terms of what content maybe we could build around that bra size guide or maybe do some remarketing. So once they leave, we serve up ads uh, with, with that particular brand. But it, the, the data does then get you asking all these questions about what else you could do. Search keywords. So um, quite a while back now, five, six, seven years ago, um, Google started to not give you uh, keyword data and you get this not provided, okay? Um, and part of that was down to privacy, um, but actually the main culprit now is because there's been a drive over the last three, four years that all websites need to be secure. Uh, it's basically meant that when someone searches for a keyword on Google, uh, and then comes through that data is encrypted so google can't actually process uh can't actually process the keywords so you get not provided when you go into google analytics and you go into acquisition and then search console um to start with there is no keyword data in there and that's because um it's gone somewhere else now uh it's gone to a thing called google search console now you can connect up google search console to your google analytics uh, and I just want to go through that process now so you see the data. But once you've done this, you should be able to see within this section here, you should be able to see all the different keywords people put into Google to then come and find you, okay? Uh, and I think this is gold dust in terms of data, in terms of uh, you can use that obviously to, to, to help you make all sorts of decisions. So I'm gonna try, um, I'm gonna try and do this live for you. So the process is you need to connect up, you need to create your Google Search Console account, okay? And then once you've set it up, um, you then need to connect it to Google Analytics. So I'm gonna give this a go, but if it doesn't work, um, I hope you'll get a sense of what you need to do. So search for Google Search Console, go into, um, click on the result, and you come to a page like this, all right? And uh, what you need to do is create your Google Search Console account, okay? So Google Search Console looks like this. Um, you would then add, uh, add a property, okay? And then what you would then do is, um, say for a dentist client, um, you would then add them in here, okay? And then press continue. And then what should happen Okay, what it's done is it's auto verified me because I've already connected to Google Analytics. So I'm hoping nine times out of 10 for you, because you've got access to analytics, Google will trust you enough and say, well, hey, you've already got good access to Google Analytics, we'll let you in for Google Search Console. And then from that, you can then, um, you can then go, go to the property there. So that's, 
that's all connected there. So once that's up, it's a case of then connecting your um, your, your search console here. So you would um, set up Google search data. This is from for a different website. Um, and in here, you should, if I get this right, um, adjust here. It says adjust search console. Okay. Uh, and then you would you would add your search console property and you, you pick it from a list here. Okay. And then add. And then from that, what you should then be able to do is see this type of view with all your um, all your keyword data. And of course, that isn't the end. I've got 915 here. You, you can show more rows if you see what I mean, and then there'll be more data for you. Okay, so content. We're always looking for more content ideas to think about. You know, in immortal words of Gary Kemp, why do I find it hard to write the next line? Um, you know what? What are you, what are we going to write about? What are we going to write about next? Um, all sorts of things you could write about, and often that might be thinking about your area and, and, and coming up with ideas. But you could also make more data-driven uh, decisions about what you write about based on what people search for. So, and go back to that brand. So. We decided we, we did some keyword research and we found that there are a lot of searches around uh, shapewear uh, and whether you should wear it uh, if you're pregnant. And it, it's slightly controversial whether you should be wearing shapewear. And there's lots of people that are for and against it. So can you wear shapewear while pregnant? We got a, a copywriter to write us a piece around this. And you can see that it shows up here. OK, so this is on our blog, um, it turns to shapewear. And you can see the blog article, the do's and don'ts of maternity shapewear, uh, and it's a nice, uh, nice blog article there. So what we can now do is go back into the data and find out actually what does this current piece of content rank for? Okay, and you do that by going. I would suggest go directly to source, which is go to Google Search Console, where all this rich data, this keyword data, is now, which you can connect to your Google analytics so what I, what we've done here it looks like an awful lot of data but but ultimately what we're trying to, what I've done is um, for just that page that talks about maternity shapewear this is telling me all the different queries that people are, are making to find that page so the top one is can you wear shapewear while pregnant what this is telling me is my position on Google is 2.9 so Roughly position three, so one to ten on Google page one is a page one ranking, which is where you need to be. Uh, it's telling me that uh, it was seen 296 times in the Google search, and out of that, about 43 people clicked through. But what's amazing, and you'll find this, is there's so many different ways people make searches, right? Well, people, people are all very different. Can you wear a waist trainer? Uh, is it safe to wear shapewear while pregnant? Can you can you wear Spanx while pregnant? All these different terms that actually I'm sure when we originally briefed our copywriter, we hadn't thought of. So this has given us loads of ideas that actually we maybe need to, waist trainer is mentioned a lot. So we're thinking about right, getting another article that's quite similar, but the vocabulary is more around waist trainer than shapewear. So it could almost be very similar, but it's just targeting that term more. Um, and the other one is, 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 is people are asking pretty much all of this is questions. So we're thinking, actually, we're going to pull some of these questions and put them into a little kind of frequently asked questions section at the bottom of that particular page. Uh, and I think then hopefully when people ask the questions, uh, we'll have a nice little answer for them on our blog post as well. So that's so you may, by digging into your actual content that you've already written, you might, in effect, get spin-off ideas to write about. Uh, and it might inspire you in terms of realising people aren't always searching for the things you thought they were searching for. OK, and finally, preparing for the, the future. So um, at the moment, we've been looking, all of these screenshots and Google Analytics is, a, is Google Analytics 3, GA3. Um, GA4 is, is the new version of Google Analytics, which is coming down the line. Now, at the moment, I would say that you don't uh, need to take 
you, you can stay with your GA3. It's obviously uh, more familiar. But, but the reason Google is now starting to promote GA4 is, is the world is changing. So uh, there was a recent survey that actually said 42% of internet users use ad blockers. I'd heard 30, and I always hear a different number, but it's 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 a it's a large chunk. And often what those ad blockers do, they block ads, but they will also block the tracking code that, that from Google Analytics that's put into websites. But obviously throws up the fact that potentially Google Analytics uh, is already not tracking potentially 42% of your users. Um, so it's as the world becomes more like this, Google Analytics 3 will become uh, less and less accurate because it just can't track uh, a large slice of you know, internet browsers, basically. Um, the world's also changing in terms of cookies. I think cookies are slowly going to die out with privacy issues. Uh, and the whole idea with GA4 really is um, that machine learning uh, machine learning kind of is going to try and almost guesstimate your traffic using different sources. Google seems quite vague about how they're going to do it, but there's basically another version coming down the pipe. Um, you know, as a marketer, you know, what uh, what can you do about that? So um, this is what the current GA3 looks like, and I'm sure it feels fairly familiar with you. It talks about users, sessions, things like that. Okay, that's GA3, and this is what GA4 looks like okay um, and my recommendation is at the moment is don't switch to GA4 yet um, but what I would do is um, you you I would set up GA4 and plug that code into your website um, so that when the time comes you've already got some historic data uh, when and that could be maybe in two or three. I can imagine within two or three years, Google will be forcing our hands to use GA4. So it would be good if you've got that set up. So when you do the switch, you've got nice historic data, so you can do year-on-year -year comparisons and things like that. It's fairly straightforward to do actually. So if we um, go into my, uh, you go into your admin here, you should see this view, a view with account, property, and view. Um, and guess what? Google is already promoting GA4. You'll probably see a banner here. So you could do the let's go. I think the let's go is pretty much the same as this. So if I click on that and GA4 setup assistant, I'm going to do it live. So forgive me if this doesn't work. I'm going to go get started. OK, create property. Um, see your GA4 property. There we go. OK, and then somewhere here, you can get the code that you need. Uh, so tag installation, uh, data streams, global site tag. Here we go. And then what you would do is you'd grab that code. And if you knew what you were doing, put that into your website or, or, or to somebody who, who does your, your web developer. And so how that should look really what you've got currently in your website is this current GA3. Um, I would ask, you'd ask your web developer to put in GA4 uh, directly below it, okay? Uh, it's in the head area of your web page at the top. Um, but don't delete your GA3. So basically, you'll carry on, carry on working with your GA3 uh, and at some point in the future, and I think what's gonna happen is you'll see more and more people talking about GA4 at some point, you can then flip to GA4 um, and, 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 and leave GA3 behind. But if you, if you don't add this code uh, and then in the future you go straight to GA4, you won't have any historical data. So year on year reports, month on re month reports uh, really won't mean that much. Um, to be honest, if I'm still getting my head around what uh, GA4 actually entails, and it, it, it does look quite different. So whereas GA3 talks about audience acquisition behavior conversions, uh, the language, uh, the jargon is slightly different. It's to engagement, monetization, retention. So it, it, there is going to be certain things uh, that you can't see in there anymore. I think something like user sessions, for example, won't be seen. But there's going to be other kind of metrics you should be able to use. That's it, pretty much. We've uh, covered off marketing channels, uh, plugging the leaks, 
bounce rate, um, where to get that lovely rich set of keywords. Um, hopefully, I've hopefully given you some idea for content and then obviously talking about GA4. Thanks very much for listening. So we're now going to have a short Q&A session. Um, Jeff, we've got a whole stream of questions, so we're, we're going to be struggling to get through them all. Um, but I'm going to go through them sort of in chronological order, so really from the start of the presentation through to the end. Okay, so the first one's about bounce rates. So would clicking on the call button not be classed as a conversion rather than a bounce, or is that not trackable? Clicking on the call button, in my view, is a conversion, right? It's, it's, a, it's something you'd want. Um, and I think sometimes if Google sees you take an action, it says, okay, that's not a bounce. But I've, I've noticed more times than not it, in real time that it's even though someone presses the call button after going to one page, you still see it, you still see that as a bounce, unfortunately, in, in my experience. Okay, great. Um, I guess the answer to the next question is how long is a piece of string but generally speaking what is an acceptable bounce rate before you should start worrying I don't, I don't have an answer because it like our dentist client we're really happy with 100 percent bounce rate thanks very much if they literally come to a page and call so it it really really it really really depends on on the market space you're in and and, and, and your content. I, I, I generally don't have an answer for that. Um, okay, what are the benefits of adding Search Console to Google Analytics compared to viewing the information on SC? Um, directly in Google Search Console. Um, I think some people are just more familiar with Google Analytics, so they they can just see all the data in one area. I as search engine optimizers, we go directly to source Google Search Console because you can just see so much more data. So my recommendation is, is, is if you really want to dig into keyword data, go to Google Search Console because you can, you can filter the data in, in so many more meaningful ways. Um, it's, yeah, I love it as a tool. So yeah. Okay. Um, how often do you think you should be looking and reporting on activities from Google Search Console? Um, well, we, we report on a monthly basis, um, but I would say that comes down to activity. If you're not doing any, if you're not updating content or doing any search engine optimization, the needle's not going to move that much in terms of your keywords. So don't, don't report on a monthly basis because you're just going to be reporting the same as last month. If you are being active at that time, then maybe I would definitely be reporting on a monthly basis. So it, depend, it depends on the level of activity. Right. Welcome your thoughts. If the highest search term or search word is the company name, is that necessarily a bad thing? No, that's a really good thing. That's so good. Um, so um, that's, that's a sign of how strong your company's brand is. Um, and Google, a ranking factor arguably is that has that data. Google wants to see that you're a strong brand. And the way Google tells that one signal is the amount of times people search for your brand. So all this stuff you do in terms of building brand, it does have a positive impact on your rankings because um, Google only really wants to put reputable people on Google page one. They don't, they don't want to put people that aren't reputable, potential spammers in their eyes. So um, I, I would fully expect uh, brand searches to be at the top of, of, most, uh, of most Google Search Console data. And that's a good thing. Okay, um, still on uh, keywords. So can I put in URL of competitors to something like Google Search Console and see what keywords they are being discovered for? Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't it? No, because you, you won't get past the uh, first base, that verification process where it says you're okay because you've got Google Analytics, you're, you've got access to Google Analytics. It won't let you pass, understandably, right? Because people could do that to you. Um, if you want competitor data, there are lots of tools out there. Um, we use a tool called uh, SEMrush, SEMrush. Um, and I shouldn't say this, but um, get a seven day free trial where you don't pay any money and then 
and then fill your boots, put in as many competitors as you like, and then and then download the reports before you run out of the seven days. What's the name of that uh, tool again? It's um, SEM Rush. It stands for Search Engine Marketing. So S E M Rush R U S H. Okay, uh, but on the subject of tools, somebody said here, do you recommend SEO writing tools such as Phrase? I don't know Phrase. Um, but there are various tools out there. Um, I, I do, rec in some ways, I recommend them with a pinch of salt. Um, if they start asking you to put the same keyword in six times in the first paragraph, I don't think that's a good thing. I think Google wants to see lovely, engaging, rich words, you know, that, that, that get people to keep, read, keep reading your content. Um, but I think these tools are quite useful just to remind you, hey, maybe you need to put a keyword in the title or in the first paragraph or, yeah, I, 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 I think they can certainly guide you to maybe write better, better, you know, Google-friendly content. Okay. Um, a couple of questions around GA4. So just to clarify, it is possible to run GA3 alongside GA4 on a single website. And the second question is, I've got a new website launching tomorrow. Should I go straight to GA4? How long before I'd like to see some meaningful data? I would I would even with a new website put both in. Um, the only slight downside, and a web developer might push back on this slightly, it is a slightly bit, there's slightly more code, isn't there, putting into each web page by adding both but to be honest it's minimal when you when you look at the lines of code we're asking for maybe four more lines in there when there's hundreds um i even for a, a website and good luck by the way with the launch um i would i would put both in for now okay um is there a way to track conversions when you don't have access to the destination website's data after they click the link e.g can we track the clicks of the link on our page does that make sense yes you can there's a way of um tracking an outbound link um yes you you can track an outbound link, but you might you might need to plug in you might be able to you might we've done this for clients um we we did this for a directory client where they uh, a successful outcome for them was actually sending people to their members or on the directory and their websites but you often have to plug in a thing called google tag manager to to track that action but it may also be possibly within possible within google analytics but it's definitely possible yeah From your experience, what is the main difference if the site is targeting on B2B and B2C from the Google Analytics Data Insight? Um, the differences between B2B and B2C. I mean, B2B typically is more lead generation, isn't it? Getting an inquiry rather than a sale, whereas B2C could be both. Um, When we report to our clients in in the B2C data, we, we, it's it's more likely to be e-commerce. So our, our successful outcomes are going to be more around revenue and, and, and number of sales and things like that. I I can't think of any noticeable differences apart from that. But there, there may be. I'm not maybe I'm not an right. expert on that. Okay, I found the technical question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there's so many questions come in. I'm sort of floating around here. So, can you please explain? Uh, so, this is going back to Google Search Console. Can you please explain domain property versus URL prefix? Yes. So, the domain property is actually the ideal one to have. Can I can I just switch that now, Phil, to explain? Or try? Yeah, go ahead. Go back yeah, to where, right. wherever. Okay. Let's. Um, so if we go back to that Google Search Console search, what the first page it takes you, doesn't it? Then we go here, and then we start now. Um, so what we're referring to is when you add a new property. Um, this this is much 
better because um, it traps all the different versions of your website, whether it's like www or non www. But to do this, you need access to the um, the DNS, which is which basically who manages your your domain name. Uh, and so sometimes it's just much more convoluted. They have to add a particular piece of code to where your domain is registered. Your like registrar, like uh, GoDaddy or one two one two three, and people like that. Whereas it's much easier to just get verified on this side because you just need access normally to Google Analytics. That's that's um, the gold standard. But the URL prefix is good enough. Right. Great. Okay. Um... Again, on GA4, it looks like bounce rate isn't in GA4, and Google is swapping it for engagement rate. Any thoughts on this? I'm going to be really honest, and I don't know enough about <laughs> GA4, so if that's great. If, yeah, um, we'll be, we won't be talking about bounce. We'll be talking about, what did you say it was? Engagement. Yes. Engage yes, engagement I suppose rate. that's the other side of the coin to bounce, right? Engagement. I don't know. Okay. Um, what are the thoughts on cross-browser device monitoring? Any tricks to pull it together? I, I, sorry, I don't, I don't know enough about enough about that to, to talk about that. As if I was an expert, so I'm a bit just being honest. You've shown what keywords Google Analytics displays that people use to find your site, but what about the words that your competitors are benefiting from? Yeah, go go back to that SEMrush tool. Um, we often do that at the start of a contract with a client. Uh, you can do keyword research until the cows come home. But but often, if if you're new to a market and you know there's competitors out there that have been doing marketing and SEO for years, go and put them into SEMrush, and you can see exactly which keywords that are working for them, and they're on page one. And that's often where we start because we kind of think, well. We're not going to reinvent the wheel here. We're just going to go straight to, to what works to get the quickest result. Okay. Um, there's still plenty more questions where they come from, Jeff. Um, does your bounce rate affect your SEO, as in you don't deliver a great experience for the customer? So does this affect your ranking? Yeah, potentially, yeah. Um, Google always talks about providing the best user experience and the best content. Um, and so if that's not as good as your competition. Uh, your bounce might be higher uh, compared to your competition. Uh, and I think that's where it might uh, affect your rankings. But I would argue that's got to be one of 200 or 300 different signals that Google uses. So again, I wouldn't obsess too much when there's, there's loads of other signals you could go for, like, you know, how fast is my website or, you know, how, how good is my content and all this sort of stuff. But yeah. Okay, so um, question here around, I guess, what should you be tracking if your website is mainly focused on information, advice, and guidance rather than sales focus, therefore less conversions? Right. So what uh, metrics would you recommend? Well, I suppose that an extreme example of that would be something like a news publication, wouldn't it? Like, say, The Guardian or Daily Mail or something like that. Um, I suppose you'd be looking for for the how good your 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 the quality of your content so an indication of that would be how long people stay on your site average time on site uh, how many pages they read before they leave um, and in terms of your seo i'd be i'd be looking at at, at, at at the range of keywords i suppose you could go straight into google google search console and look at, at the keyword data Metrics like that, it's, it's about the quality experience if there, you know, right. there aren't really any conversions, I suppose. Right. Okay. Um, specific question about the dentist example. So mm -hmm. how do you know that after visiting the site, they are actually calling and not just looking at the page and thinking this is not for me? Does the dentist do follow-up surveys on the phone to see how they got the number? Uh, no, we don't know. <laughs> We know we track the button click on the website um, and we know where those people come from, though. So and we also know when we started with them two years ago, their phone was ringing not very often. And now it rings. I don't know. We generate 40 or 50 phone calls a month for them. So 
yeah we don't exactly know and and they don't have time as most dentists don't to do those follow-ups uh, unfortunately right okay um how useful are referrals as a source as i find these figures are generally low in my experience and how can this be increased any thoughts yeah so a referral is when someone uh, clicks on a link to your website from another website is the definition um how can you increase this um we um guest posting would be a great way of doing that so if you manage to write content on say your industry blog uh and in the bottom there were if there were links within the article to your website or within your bio at the bottom it was you know yourself from so and so to me you're setting yourself out uh in your market space as an expert uh in your field and i think people would then naturally think gosh i've got to get in touch with these people and click through to your website and that link as well would obviously then have seo value because it's what we call a backlink so that's that that would that would be super, super, super good in terms of SEO because it's coming from an industry source. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, just uh, we're running out of time, actually, Jeff. So just a couple more questions, and honestly, there are loads and loads which I haven't been able to cover. Okay. Um, so the penultimate question is: um, I often find Google Analytics underreports the traffic the website gets from Facebook activity. Have you seen that? Yes, uh, and you can fix it. So it's so so frustrating. Um, when you um, you get uh, social media stuff and Google Analytics doesn't classify it as social, they say it's referral. Um, so the way to fix that is if you go into admin here, okay, um, and you want to make sure it reports it's social going forward, you go into your admin section and then in channel grouping here and then default channel, go into social, you have to train it to say, hey, all that, all that, um, you have to go source, and then I'll do contains, and then anything Facebook. Uh, and that will then, it won't be retrospective, but what it will do is any future content will no longer be classed as referral, it will be Facebook. And we go into new clients accounts all the time where we see this. I don't know why Google Analytics isn't better at it, but it's still it's still not great. Great, that's a great tip. Okay, um, and the final question, uh, Jeff, is Google Analytics accurate? Does it record every single user visiting my website? No, it's not, and they've always said it only samples a certain percentage and then and then kind of, backfills what they think the full uh the full data set is so you'll often find when you start cutting your data by say social and new users and uh, i don't know a certain age and demographic that the data starts to not make sense when you go down to that granular level and it's because it's um it's sample data it isn't 100 percent accurate Okay, great. Um, well, thank thank you again, Jeff. That's brilliant. Um, some really great answers to our questions. Apologies if we couldn't get through all of the questions and I haven't asked uh, yours in particular. Um, so that's all the time we have for our webinar today. I'd like to say thanks again to Jeff for today's presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next Webinar Express Advanced Storytelling is on Thursday, the 14th of October at 1 p.m hosted by CIM East of England. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you'll also be able to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, thank you again, Jeff, for a really good presentation, and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.